Hello and welcome. Welcome to part two of the Smart Plus webinar series. Today is all about mapping the career. Why do we need to map the career? Well, the world is changing. We all know that, well, from our experience in the last year, that classrooms, school, exams, everything is becoming digitalized, going virtual. But we're just at the start of a new digital paradigm in society as well as in education, and that will impact the career. And it's not really just about adopting digital tools. This is not just about digitalization. This is a bigger digital transformation, a change. It's about being digital as opposed to doing digital. So how does that affect our careers? And how does that affect mapping the career? Because if you think about it, if you put the student at the heart of that journey, then everybody involved, the stakeholders in that journey, we have to think differently about our expectations, our role, and how we can help. So welcome, everybody. Welcome to the webinar. My name is Graham Brown. I'll be the moderator here today. I'm not the expert. I'm here to get the best out of the experts and also to field questions from the audience. I'll introduce our experts very shortly. But over to you. Would love to hear from you. Say hello. Where are you from? There is a chat icon right at the bottom of your screen here. You can see the chat icon. What I want you to do is just type in there, hi, where you're from in the world, which country you're from. Last time we had a lot of people from different countries all over interested in the global family that we have here around the schools. So we'd love to hear a little bit for you from you. I'll read out some of the comments as they come through on the chat stream. And then what we'll do is we'll introduce our speakers in good time. So let's see who you are and where you're from. So we have people from Tokyo. It's great to see. We've got two from Tokyo coming in today. Dubai, Pune, India. We've got a couple here from Dubai. So great to see all these comments coming in. Um, really, the interest in the career and mapping the career is global. So it's great to see people's interest in this webinar today. So hopefully we can share some insights. And what we're going to do is we're going to work through with an interactive uh, document as well and take some of your questions. More from Dubai coming in. First one from Singapore. Fantastic. Great to see. Greetings from Singapore over here. So if you are following this series, if you missed the first one, then what you can do is you can grab your phone and like so, take a photo of this QR code thing here. If you scan that, what it will do is it'll take you to a link on Spotify and that will sync you up with the School of the Future podcast, which will give you access to the audio from today, the audio from the last webinar, the audio from all the future webinars coming up here in the, in the, the series, and then also audio from all the previous webinars that you may have missed. So you won't miss anything if you scan that and subscribe on Spotify. So coming up today, what are we talking about? Well, firstly, let's introduce the experts from today. I'm just going to read their names out first. I'm going to ask them to talk a little bit about themselves after the poll. So we have Melissa Maria, who's back. We had her on the last series before on the podcast as well. Melissa, welcome. Great to have you here again. Thank you, Graham. Pleasure is mine. You've been busy today. It's been anything special going on on Smart Campus today? Yes, we are having our IMC assessment. So this is a business excellence, education excellence assessment happening. And we have our assessors online, actually. So Excellent. Busy. Are they here today watching? Oh, uh, I guess they would enter in. I've shared the link with them. So hopefully. Excellent. Hello, assessors. Great to see you here. And also joining us, Dr. Aparna Mukherjee. Um, Aparna, great to have you here all the way from SMU. We're going to talk a little bit about your career and your background as well. Um, lovely to have you here today. 
thanks for joining us. I guess this is a busy time for you as well at the university. So great that you could spare the time to talk with us today. Looking forward to your insights on careers and you're obviously involved very much firsthand with career advice with students as well. So I'm sure we're going to learn a lot here today. So welcome to the webinar, Aparna. Thank you. Thank you, Fran. Glad to be here and sharing the platform with the with our um, revered principal, Ms. Maria, and then of course you as well. Thank you so much. Excellent. Great. So let's get started. We have a poll coming up now. We want to know a little bit about the audience here today um, because what's on the top of your mind? So the audience really is made up educators, parents, as well as some students as well. The poll coming up here is really asking your top of mind concerns about career choices. So you may be an educator, you may be a student yourself, you may be a parent like myself, I have a 14 year old son. This is a critical time in career choice or is it? Is it too early? Is it too late? Should my son really be thinking about his career already? Should he already know what his career is at this young age? So what are the main concerns for students in your opinion? choosing a career today. So you have the poll in front of you here, and we would like you to vote on the poll. Um, select the answer which you think is most appropriate from your experience, the students that you may deal with, or it could be your own children as well, or as an educator, some of the feedback that you've heard from students. So these concerns range from age, too much choice, skill mismatch, to maybe worried about committing too early, to worried about meeting parental expectations. That's always a concern as well. So the, we have a little bit of time left on the poll. So let's see as these votes come in. I'm just gonna ask Melissa to comment. Melissa, I'm not sure if you can actually see the choices in front of you, but as the votes are coming in, don't know which age to start seems to be the most popular choice here. You see that from your students? Well, yes, I think uh, importantly now, this kind of choice is beginning early on. Uh, I see that parents and students early on want to know how they can be led into choosing their careers. So we mm. have children as young as grade six, seven, wanting to know things. Yeah, so from my experience of so many years, I feel that this timeline is moving downwards. Yeah, yeah, it certainly is from when I remember when I was at school, you chose your career literally the month before you went out into the workplace or when you were choosing your university Absolutely. course. And even in that, in that case, choosing a university course didn't have much bearing on your career either. It seemed to be something that you could just do because it was interesting careers were really an afterthought in the educational process. I'm talking about last century when I was educated though. So things are a little bit different now. Um, Aparna, before we talk a little bit about yourself as well, let's have a look at some of those results. If you can see those in front of you in the screen, maybe we can get those up. Um, number one, don't know which age to start. Number two, too much choice. Three, demand for skills that don't exist yet. Four, worried about committing to a career path too early. And lastly, worried about meeting parental expectations. Maybe a little bit biased here because parents were answering <laughs> this poll. So I think there's a bit of a confirmation bias going on there. I'm sure as a psychologist, you would appreciate that one. Aparna, for yourself, how does this sort of confirm or maybe, you know, flesh out or maybe disagree with some of your um, more qualitative findings from working with students? What do you see? Thanks for the question, Graham. So I, if I may add to, uh, to Melissa, while my own path wasn't exactly direct, uh, my research and experience tells me that many students might still wait until after high school graduation to even consider their career options. And even then, they may not be fully understand what each career one entails, right? Um, and as, uh, as uh, with uh, Melissa, our job as educators is to inspire and inform our students. Mm -hmm. The more informed they can be, the more successful they will be, right? And then as you rightly pointed out, uh, this is the world's first digital generation, so to speak, I would think. And our students are as connected to technology 
as they are to each other. And that's a lot. Mm. So um, I think at least what I see from my students, which are vastly undergraduate and postgraduate students in the university, uh, the internet is a way of life. And, and uh, the purpose of uh, careers, interest, curiosity buildup, all of that is, is definitely a collaborative uh, engagement alongside technology and alongside people and professionals who are there with their expert help and guidance. Mm. So it's just, that's how I see it going forward. Great. Okay. Well, Aparna, let's start with yourself. Maybe we can talk about your career path. If we can get the screen up here, just so we can have a look at our panel here today. And then what I'll do is I'll ask you to talk a little bit about both of you, your careers as well. In a sense, traditional and yet non-traditional. There's a good mix there. Um, you both have gone through the system, if I can put it that way, and done very well in the system. Um, one wonders as a parent, whether or not that pathway is replicable in the 2020s. So yourself, Aparna, um, psychologist by training, what's the story? Where did that start? I mean, your role today, it says on your business card that you are a senior quality assurance manager. Help us understand what that exactly is and where's the link with psychology? And then maybe we can go back a little bit and talk about the genesis of your journey in your career as well. Of course, Gurf, glad to share a bit of uh, my life or my uh, professional life, actually. So um, I remember um, at the um, young, very young age of uh, 17, before I turned an adult, um, I started being extremely interested uh, in psychology because that was one of the majors that we had for our um, high school um, back in India. And uh, that is something that stayed with me. And I took up uh, my undergraduation uh, with honors and then a master's and then, of course, a PhD in psychology going forward. Um, of course, the interest persisted for a very long time for me to take all of this um, uh, you know, professional uh, uh, educational uh, certifications going forward. I also did another diploma to help me with education and learning um, in, in um, instructional design, so to help teach and learn and stuff. Um, and then, of course, what happened was um, psychology, of course, as a, as a program and a course, it branches out to different flavors. So you have different ways of, of being or understanding psychology. So I had taken up industrial psychology as well. As, um, and then that is where the business school um, kind of aligned or working in a business school aligned with my career aspirations um, after I graduated. Um, because in the business school environment that I'm here right now at SMU, um, it has a lot to do with people management. Uh, it has a lot to do with uh, uh, leadership and negotiations um, and and those are all that I really did learn back in, during my during my master's and my graduation mm. so that's how it kind of kind of really um, aligned with where I am it is a very aligned career path isn't it your studies your doctorate your work your faculty now as well it's all very much aligned in a sense, you could say the stars were in alignment with that career path as well. At what age did even that word psychology enter your consciousness as a career choice? Did it evolve as you went along? Or was it, you know, when you say like junior high school, high school, I want to do psychology, I want to work in this field? How did that happen? I, I think... Um... I, I think to the best of my memory, um, I was really interested in the subject. It, I, it, I didn't really align it with what kind of job might I get after I complete my master's or my PhD. It was just that a basic interest and passion about the subject that started me on this route. Hmm. And that's exactly after my undergraduation, that's exactly what it inspired me to, to take up my master's. And then of course, a research, a much more detailed research in the area. Uh, but of course, the, the whole thing rested on being really passionate about learning something i didn't really align it to oh this is the job prospect that's going to you know have me really interested in it it was never uh -huh. um you know something it was never again something that my parents said you have to do or i aligned it with a job in the future in the future work environment to take this forward it was just mm -hmm. a passion for the subject mm -hmm. i'm very fortunate that there was employment in that area as well um, that you could find, you know, a meaningful career 
in that as well. Yourself, Melissa, as well, very much at an early stage involved in education, passionate about education. What was the trajectory for you? Was it as aligned as a, a partner? Was it at an early age that you knew education and then you got training and went into the career? How did it work for you? Well, if I should tell you, I wanted to enter medicine and um, for whatever reason, I couldn't get there. Uh, so I began early on working with children. Uh, so I took on, when I was doing my graduation, actually, I began teaching at a school, a church school, and that was just to volunteer. And I realized that as I worked with them, because I was, I was teaching them English and I was doing history with them, uh, I began to realize that that is what I really like doing. So mm -hmm. I then, uh, I mean, coincidentally, I am a psychology student as well. And uh, that also gave insights into how people think, how people behave. And somehow I caught on to that. Uh, but I continued my volunteering and part-time working in schools. So I would go to college and then do part-time uh, teaching as well. So I decided if it was not medicine, then I guess it is teaching. Hmm. So early on, um, I enjoyed it. And so I kind of carried on with teaching. I did my professional qualification and became a teacher. I started as a teacher. I still am. Yes, very much so. And, you know, it's been a, a fantastic career as well. And I, in, if you go back to some of the other podcasts as well, with Melissa speaking as well, you can hear a little bit about the backstory and our passion for teaching as well. It wasn't a straight trajectory, but in a sense, if you take away the context, the context of what you do, that passion for helping people and educating people, whether it was psychology or teaching, it's the same, isn't it, as well? I wonder, did you have, uh, was there a who, a person, Melissa, in your background who really flipped the switch, the light bulb went on for you in teaching? Because quite often that is the case where people find their passion. They have not necessarily a mental figure. It could be a parent or they could hear a story or they could read a book or they could come across, you know, a, a very sort of personal narrative that made that realistic for them. For yourself, how did that happen? In fact, uh, I remember telling you earlier, and I'll, I'll narrate that again, it was a teacher. Uh, her name was Christabel Carey. She had assigned me a task to do with my friends. And I began actually teaching a concept to my friends. And she said, you know, Melissa, and I was in grade eight then. Uh, she said, you know, I think you'll make a great teacher. And I looked at her and I said, but I don't want to teach. I want to go and you know, become a doctor. She says, mm. okay, but I still remember her because I think she caught on that early on, that my connectedness with people or my ability to articulate what I want to convey. Uh, she caught that on early. So I'm glad, actually. I, I'm absolutely glad for what I have chosen. Being with children and working with them has been greatest moments of satisfaction for me. You wonder those conversations, how that seed planted in your mind grew and flourished. If that never had happened, it wasn't formal advice, was it? But it was somebody that believed in you and okay. said that you can do this. And maybe that opened a door for you that didn't exist before. That's so you, you wonder as well, I mean, is it coincidence? Is it fate? Or would you have found yourself in that domain eventually anyway? I mean, there's many ifs and buts and we're sort of going back over past histories, aren't we? But it just goes to the show, you know, I think what's something we'll talk about today and especially, um, you know, something Apana can help us understand a bit better is that the role of people around us in our career choices and the impact that they have. And it may not necessarily be formalized. It may be the advice that they give in informal ways as well, but there's a lot of influences on people's careers and not necessarily, I think those influences are all explicit. So I think this is something that we'll understand a little bit better today. If we can, just before we go into look at the career map and look at what needs to change and hear some of Apana's experiences as well. Let's go back to the poll, if we will. Can we get that poll back up? Is it possible to bring that back on the screen? Um, 
Yeah, so let's have a look at the poll. So we asked you the main concerns, the audience um, don't know which age to start. That was the most popular choice. What I'm going to do is I'm going to ask some of the audience just to put their hand up if you put that. So there's a function on the down here at the bottom of Zoom. There's a function where you can put your hand up. So if you raise your hand, if you put that as your answer, don't know which age to start, put your hand up on Zoom. I just want to see who actually put that as an answer. It's just like being back in class, isn't it? Put your hands up, folks. You know how it happens. You know the drill. Okay, so put your hands up. Okay, so um, great. If you put your hand up, what I want to happen now is keep your hand up if you have your audio and your video ready to go on and join us here because I'm going to ask you a question. I need a volunteer. So I'm going to pick a volunteer from the teachers are very good at this. They do this all the time. So for me, getting volunteers from adults is a little bit more work. But if you put your hand up, keep your hand up if you want to tell us a little bit about that choice. So I have one person left who's kept their hand up. Well done, Nidhi Rastogi. So keep your hand up. What I'm going to ask is my engineer just to bring Nidhi into the conversation here. Or have they disappeared now? Oh, do we have them? Excellent. Very good. This is exciting. Are they joining us? Okay. So Nidhi Rastogi. Um, can we just ask them to unmute and maybe we can chat to Nidhi now and just find out a little bit more about their answers here. So Nidhi Rastogi, can you hear us? Yep, do we have Nidhi on the line? Can I get my engineer just to unmute there? Uh, maybe they're a little bit shy. Oh, they are unmuted. Nidhi, hello there. Can you yeah, hear us? Hi. hi, Graham. Hello, Nidhi. Hi, everyone. Hello there. Um, thank you for joining us and thank you for participating in this webinar. And you probably didn't realize you were going to be participating in this webinar, but <laughs> thank you very much for being part of it. That's how it happens. It's interactive. So we like the audience to join in. Um, Nidhi yourself, you answered, don't know which age to start. What's the um, context? Are you a parent, an educator? Tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, sure. Thanks for the opportunity, Graham. I am from Dubai and I'm a mother of a five, five year old daughter. Mm -hmm. uh, so I'm uh, being my first kid who is at the age of five. I just wonder when to start with her and, you know, directing her and guiding her with the career choices and how to put her in that kind of frame, mind frame that she has to decide something for herself for the future and how to teach those aspects what to decide and how to look forward that what she wants to do in her, mm. you know, coming years. As a mother, I'm a little concerned because we had, uh, you know, time for us, for ourselves to decide when we were at our, you know, at the age of growing, we were, uh, we, I think we had a much less stressed situations nowadays. The competition is tough. The, uh, you know, um, the, the children have so many things to do and to learn and to decide for themselves. So it's really challenging that how to uh, put a kid on the track and make them understand what they have to decide for themselves. Excellent. Nidhi, thank you very much for sharing the story. And before I ask the panelists to Thanks. chime in with their thoughts as well, can you tell us a little bit about your daughter? What, in terms of personality, what's she like? What, is, what does she like? Is she sort of scientific or is she creative? What, what's the, what do we know about her? Yeah, uh, so uh, my daughter, her name is Pragna Rastogi, and uh, she is a very talkative or communicative child rather and very expressive and creative. So whatever, whenever her teachers gives her term reports or the progress reports, they always mention that she is very creative and very uh, expressive and communicative child. So she likes to be connected with the people, mm -hmm. with her classmates. So she can have the conversations with any person irrespective of the age group. And that's one of her, you know, um, uh, qualities and I would like to build upon that but then again she has to develop that kind of skills how to make it more meaningful rather than just having communications with the kids and the adults and having some conversation so there has to be a, an aligned you know a mapping career mapping we can say if I have to start her on the basis of the communication mm. 
and the creativity very much. has to be put and the creativity also has to be evolved into that aspect absolutely this is a great question yeah. there's so many questions there melissa would you like to go fast in terms of i'm sure you've heard this before you deal a lot with younger children as well and the parents there's a lot of pressure isn't there there's a lot of pressure on parents now and feeling that they should at a younger age and i imagine a lot of it is they listen to other parents and social media or my child's already doing this and my child's doing these activities and why isn't your child doing this there's a lot of pressure isn't there so what would you say to needy and from this experience obviously we've only got the surf surface information so Nidhi, thank you for the question. And I do definitely understand the concern that you're going through. Uh, but being uh, you know, an educator myself and being in the school setup for more than 20 years, all I can tell you is that your child has another 13, 14 years in school life and things are going to change and evolve. Uh, my sense is that the more exposure that children have, you know, as they move along, you keep exposing them uh, little by little. And in time, your child would be able to actually uh, make decisions as to where her inclination lay. As parents and as educators, our role is providing that exposure, showing them that entire platform that is available of everything that is out there, ascertaining what he or she is good at, where his interests or her interests lay. And then our experience has been that through the programs that we have in school and as parents, children are able to come up with their choices, make their choices. And as parents and as adults, we should be supporting those choices. So I think our role lay in giving that exposure to them, providing everything that is available for them to absorb and see. Mm. Great advice, isn't it? Apana, yourself, you... you obviously deal with students who are much older um, but is there also a risk that you do, do you get students who come to you that have at a very young, young age have somehow had a determined career path and then by the time they come to you they're almost having second thoughts there's always this is a balancing act isn't it that you know it's great to nurture an interest in somebody and a child but by the time they get into their late teens and 20s, they start to now develop their own interests as well. Absolutely, Graham, and it's it's a kind of evolution. And thanks, maybe, for the question. Um, to build up on this context, can I just say that across the world, uh, young people who live education today are on an average more highly qualified than any preceding generation in history. They often enter the working world with considerably more years of schooling than their parents or perhaps grandparents as well. And, and this is absolutely an enormous achievement of which the global education community can be truly, truly proud. So thank you, uh, Principal Maria and the school for everything that you're doing. Um, we should also note here that staying longer in education than ever before, what happens is, as you rightly pointed out, Graham, today's young people must make more decisions about what, where, and how hard they will study. And these are investment decisions, basically. That's how in the business uh, school, that's what we talk about. Uh, and sometimes uh, that becomes increasingly difficult because technology is changing the working world itself so quickly. Now, good schools like GIS will respond by helping young people to become critical thinkers about the labor market and how it relates to their learning. Uh, but I, I can tell you that never before has effective, has, has effective career guidance been so important uh, and never before has there been a greater onus on employers to step up and work with schools to help young people understand jobs and careers and and really help and assist teachers bring learning to life right and and we talk all about problem-based learning problem-based case studies and all of that which i'm sure in schools they have started doing as well um to actually answer uh, nidhi's question it, it can be really very tough for, for someone her daughter's age to understand that the academic choices uh, that she makes uh, will have an impact on her future career in a very real way, right? Uh, but I, I think when you're that young, and I have had uh, my colleagues' uh, children come over and talk to me at some point three, four years ago, and then they come and talk to me now with very different ideas. 
Uh, what I really ask them to do when I have this initial conversation with them is zoom out to adulthood and reflect on the kind of work you see yourselves doing, right? And, and remind them that it's okay to have multiple ideas. You can be a doctor, as, as Melissa wanted to be a doctor or a teacher. You can be a, a DJ and a doctor and, and a physicist and a scientist. The goal is to generate as many as possible choices and choose what best matches their interests, talents, and skills. And, and so it becomes easier then to look out for resources to help them research a variety of careers, right? Because you have so many multiple ideas to think of, right? You, you're not being told this is the only way that things have to be done. Um, and, and then, of course, you, you try to build up your, your strengths by taking courses which are aligned to your, to your career exploration as well. And I guess at some point when you see something connecting with a desired profession in terms of what you're taking up in school, um, you're more likely to graduate on track to pursue your goal without any surprises, right? Or panic. Hmm. This is great advice is that as parents, as educators, in that process, it's really opening doors for the children, isn't it? For the students and showing them options, that expanding their options rather than driving them down one specific career path, because there may be within that career path, something that they enjoy, like with Marissa, Melissa, that they find in another career path, you know, that idea of helping that could be, or, you know, serving people that could be in medicine as well as it could be in education. So the key here is experiencing many different things. And our role is to expand those options for the students as well. So let's talk about that in the second half of this webinar. Let's talk about the actual map, the career map, because it's changed. I mean, it's changed in the time that we've been at school to now. Well, I mean, a few years ago, obviously, but the idea that you had this singular career path, and I'm sure as we are in Asia as well, how pertinent that is with previous generations, family expectations about what you would be. If you were male, it would be a doctor, accountant, engineer. If you're female, it would be an education, for example, but things have changed. Here we have, for example, a very traditional career trajectory, which I suppose many people see as route one in their career now, which is you started off in the you know, get your feet under the table job as a shift supervisor, then a manager, then a general manager and a director. You know, you found a good company. You found a way of keeping your head down, look after your boss, make sure you don't make any mistakes. And eventually when your boss retires or maybe passes on, then you can fill his or her shoes. That's kind of how it worked. We all know that that system that job for life has changed. And yet a lot of education is still built around this concept as well. I mean, even if you were to look, for example, um, if you look at the next slide, we still think in these terms, this has taken, um, I'm not singling out DBS, it just so happens that they happen to be here in Singapore, um, but a bank here in Singapore, we still think in these terms, these narratives of staircases and ladders when it comes to careers, don't we? We've even visualized them as ladders. So you can imagine when we talk about careers and we visualize them as ladders to students that they think in these terms, a ladder only has one direction, up or down, not as we've kind of heard, left or right, a possible option here as well. And if you look at the next line as well, here is the career ladder. And that was what it was 20 or 30 years ago. And yet this is how I think now we're talking about in the context of this conversation, it's not just about career choice, it's mindsets and skills. Aparna's talking about these more broader skills that we need in career choices as well. So looking at those imageries that I've flashed up here, Aparna yourself, do students still think in these terms like career ladders or is that still, you know, have they sort of caught on to this idea that it's a, a lot more messy, the map now? But what's sort of their expectations when they come to you? Um, I, I think given again my experience over the last couple of years, it has been that students are more flexible around their choices. They also try to balance uh, you know, more than ever, double majors when they actually uh, finish the undergrads or postgrads, so that 
different options or career choices are available to them once they graduate. So for say, somebody taking up um, a, 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 an undergraduate study at the business school at SMU, he or she might be able to do a double major in law and business or accounting and business so that it's not only your career aspiration at the end of the day is not only aligned to just one particular area or niche field. So they're much more flexible around choices that they make. They're much more eager to kind of explore um, other industries as well, given, given of course, how they can um, um, go through their career options available. Um, and yes, they understand it's it's much more of a messy process. It's not re really a linear process that uh, we grew up, we were used to when we grew up. Uh, it's much more lateral shifts and, and of course vertical shifts and it's, it looks much more messy, it, at least the career map that I have in my mind looks much more messy than the one that you, you showed on screen right now. So yes. Dynamic, I think is a better word, isn't it? The messy. <laughs> right, right. Agile. And Melissa, yourself, and from the educator's perspective as well, there seems to be a lot of focus now, and we talked about this with Atul in the last podcast webinar as well, about, I suppose you could call them soft skills and training students in soft skills, but soft skills is always being talked about in the pejorative, isn't it? It's always sort of a nice to have that you could add to your resume and CV, but really wouldn't get you a job. But now it seems, and if you go back to the Atul uh, podcast as well, that these soft skills are probably the most important skills that we need in, in being ready for the workplace as well. And that, how could those soft skills and what exactly are they that would equip students today to make better career choices and navigate the career map better? My own experience is that today no longer we are talking of a single individual working in a field. I think what is more important is to work in a team and team dynamics are very important. So I think in terms of respect, tolerance, um, these are things that become very important. So I think what we do at least at school is to put children together in groups so that they are actually able to work in a team, respect each other's ideas, give people a chance, listen to one another. So communication here, Etiquettes of communication come into picture as well. Uh, I think more and more we are understanding that the world outside is no longer working in silos. Mm. You can't be just doing your bit and thinking that everything will fit well, you know. So uh, options that are available out there also calls for teamwork, calls for collaboration, uh, calls for crisp communication as well. Uh, so I think these are things that we are encouraging in our children, mm. because I think it has a direct relation to what they are going to pick in future. Uh, also, you know, from the previous question, uh, I, I thought I must uh, share this because more and more we know when children talk, they are very clear that they don't want to stick to one profession. So when they are choosing their subjects also, it's quite heartening to see that there is a combination, there's a mix, there's a science and a humanity subject that gets mixed up because they're keeping their options open of entering different fields. So along with these choices, I think these are the other soft skills that we are talking about, you know, communication being the greatest and collaboration being next, uh, yeah. which is critical uh, that is going to kind of take them forward. If you think about what's really happened in the last year, we've all experienced this, whether in the world of work or in education, how much has changed? Obviously, there was, let's go back a year. January 2020 was when really COVID was on the news agenda. We didn't really think of it in terms of the impact of how it's going to change society. And then in February, we realized actually this was getting out of hand. And then it's February, March, there were a lot of changes. The schools had to make changes. You know, we had the lockdowns and so on. And that has really radically transformed in many ways, people's understanding of work and education um, for the students as well. They've adapted very well. I think us parents have adapted probably a little bit slower because we're older and we have experience. So, but you realize now that that sort of adaptability, how important that is in career and what you're talking about as well, like whether it's double majors or open choices as well. I wonder how you train that adaptability because 
you go into the world of work, if you go into businesses, you go into the world of tech, or you go into any boardroom, people are talking about agile. Agile being this concept that you can adapt and you can be dynamic and you can absorb change. You could you know, you can produce when there aren't any rules sometimes or when, you know, the game changes and how important that is in business and education. Now, how do you train that? And I wonder as well, I want to frame this a bit because I know Melissa and Apana yourself, your personal backgrounds, you've lived in different countries, you've experienced different cultures, um, starting with yourself, Melissa, countries that you've lived in. So I've been in India, of course, born, brought up there. Then I worked in the Middle East, which is Oman, a beautiful country. And then, of course, uh, Singapore. And each of them had their own, uh, you know, cultural uh, framework that you had to operate in. And obviously, it is important then to be aligned with what that culture asks for. So mm. uh, Middle East was a pretty conservative culture. But yet, uh, I mean, the Sultan uh, was a very dynamic person, very open person, um, highly educated. Uh, so what importance he gave and how as a school we moved there. And then coming to Singapore, it's a different story altogether, highly advanced and our campus also very technologically advanced. So the kind of um, adaptability that you're talking about uh, I think it automatically comes in, you know, depending on the place that you are at. Yeah. Yeah. That adaptability, it's sort of almost second nature for yourself, a partner as well. Countries. Right. Yes. Yes, of course. Graham. So uh, when we had our initial conversation, yes, I've lived in about three countries, uh, the U S India, and of course, Singapore, um, over the last, um, two decades and um, cultural intelligence and, and diverse mindset is one of the biggest things that employers, when I talk to them, um, did talk about. EQ and, and of course, cultural intelligence and diverse mindset, because as, as uh, Melissa rightly points out, um, the thing about operating in silos, um, that idea has really gone out of, the, out of everywhere, right? You are working in teams, collaborating virtually all across the world. So your mindset has to be much more effective and aligned to position yourself as part of the team globally. Um, and for that, you need to have a really good communication skills, um, culturally apt um, uh, kind of understanding of each other as a team. So I remember when my students would join in, and especially for the undergrads as well as postgrads, you'd actually have psychological questionnaires for them to answer. Um, before we put them into groups together so that they can be extremely efficient while working together and understand a bit of themselves while doing so as well. Mm. So yes, um, extremely, extremely, I, I, I concur with you. Very important for you to be, to have the soft skills so to speak, anymore. Those are much more, as, this is what, what you need to have nowadays. Well, well, you, you mentioned um, psychological questionnaires as well. Sorry, go ahead, Melissa. Sorry, I was just making this point. Recently, I was reading an article uh, you know, we've been talking about IQ for a long time, and then came EQ, and then came CQ, and the last I was looking at is AQ, and I was completely intrigued, because CQ is curiosity, and I said, yes, great, looking at curiosity, but the last one is actually adaptability quotient, and that is being given importance now, you know, over the other cues that we've been talking about. So I think you're very right when you say that adapting and adaptability, agility, all these are critical. And I'd like to add one more component of resilience. Even when we are mapping you know, all these careers of students, how can we train them to be resilient if they have not made the right choice? You know, How to come back to say, it's all right. I may not have made the right choice, but I can redo it. Yeah. How do you train AQ though? I mean, I know, know how you could train IQ. You could do a lot of IQ tests. How do you train resilience? Let's say you had a five-year-old girl, daughter. How would you, you know, help her work on her AQ over time? What are the options there? I think it is something that doesn't come overnight. In a school setup, it has to be a culture. And I always believe that if we start 
respecting failure, that is saying it is all right to fail, that kind of builds resilience within you, you mm. know, because you have the supporting environment that says it's all right to fail, never mind, pick up from here and let's do the next. I think those would be the starting points to build resilience within students. So giving them that opportunity to fail and rise again. Excellent. Let's draw a map. So in the modern world, we have interactive whiteboards, just like we used to have the old blackboards and chalk. We've moved on. We've moved into the 21st century. So if we can bring up the interactive whiteboard now, what I'm going to do is with our guests, our panel, we're going to map out the modern career and then look at the the workflow in business terms of how that all comes together and all the stakeholders to use business terms again of who should be involved in the decision making and what we should do and really this is a living working document so i encourage the audience here today just as you have done already to submit your questions and your comments as we work through this and as the panelists talk through this i'll be making notes on the whiteboard and stick around to the end of the webinar and you can get a copy of this interactive whiteboard i'll give you a link um, share it with you so you can play around with it this is a great tool as well whether you use it in your business or you can give it to your students as well these tools are great for collecting and collating and teamwork as well so let's do this i'm going to share this if i can just ask my engineer to flip this over so let's bring this up on the screen. So let's talk about the modern career map. We've talked about the old school career map here, which we understand is old school and passe. But let's have a look at the modern career map and let's start mapping this out. And as I do this, I welcome comments and questions from the audience as well. Um, you know how to do that just as you did at the beginning, just put your hand up. And not your hand up, sorry, just put your comment in the chat box. We'll field all the questions as we go along. So where does the modern career map start? We have to pick one of these. So who starts the modern career map? I guess, would I venture the student being the starting point? Where, where does this start? Or is it a conversation the teacher needs to have with the student? Is there a natural starting point for this? Um, Melissa, as you deal with the youngest of the students here, um, what would you venture as the starting point for a modern career map? It starts in the classroom, I would say, student and teacher together. It starts okay. there. Okay. And how does that conversation start? Is, I mean, and sort of importantly, what age as well? And what age is a good age? Because I'm sure some of the educators and parents want to know. I want a number. I want an answer. They want mm -hmm. definitives as well, rather than maybes at this point. We, we have a program within school that actually starts uh, for the primary school, that is grades one upwards, where we would have, um, you know, exposure to different uh, professionals. Mm -hmm. It would be a dress up day, there would be uh, talks about the different professions available. So uh, that's part of their curriculum and then their activities around that. So early on, when they are in the primary segment, they already know the different professions that are available and you know what they could choose from. Of course, these may not be the complete list, but at least it begins there. Mm -hmm. what, what are you doing? What's your objective here? Is it to give them options, to show them? Exposure, I think, is the right. most uh, important. What Just does exposure mean? I mean, that's is it it's a choice of word, isn't it? Like you've obviously chosen exposure as opposed to experience or something else. Why, what are you talking about here? Exposure to what is out there, just knowing what is out there, all the different professions that are out there, uh, making them aware of it, maybe aware and exposed could mm -hmm. be the two you know, objectives there. Is there to some degree, when you talk about awareness, like a, a sense of demystifying it, make taking the fear away from it a little bit as well that i suppose children especially at a young age may feel a little bit intimidated as well by you know now this day and age graham i really doubt that children are afraid i don't see that sense of fear no overwhelm as much that mm. used to be when we were kids children are 
very confident nowadays i feel i mean this is my experience i hardly see a kindergarten child crying coming to school teachers don't have that to do now you know pacify them to enter class they are happy entering different worlds absolutely different so yeah better um, world as well so a part of yourself like let's let's fast forward this now to later stages so we talk about higher education for example um what was the how, how's this changing now who's involved in the career map and firstly what kind of ages and what are the, the conversations happening here i think uh, when you're talking about higher education be it tertiary education or quaternary education um it's still basically the student because he or she would be the owners uh, of their self knowledge right i mean um they have made some certain decisions in school or high school that have led them to be where they are in terms of, of uh, education going forward um i i see that at least in the undergraduate level it ha- it becomes much more of a student and plus community so we have employers coming in in the picture um i think the role of parents definitely is still there it's still around but the the role of parents i probably where i stand from uh were much more relevant and important uh when they were making these decisions just before college or entering college um and i see mostly employers um and mostly my colleagues in the career services department as, as well as the professors and the faculty who along with the student built up this knowledge sharing community to take their interests further mm. of course parents are always always involved in making these decisions a reality in total because uh, ultimately at the end of the day you, we we do need to get a buy in from them to some degree but yes it it has become much more of a community of knowledge shares while they get into tertiary education what do you want your students doing at that age where if you go back to primary where it's exposure maybe they're having fun maybe they're seeing for the first time uh somebody work in their career for example at higher education or university what's the objective now are they sort of narrowing things down are they putting skills onto paper what would be your objective as a career advisor here um no actually not gram actually what has happened is we have revamped curriculums um with, with you know internally at the university both undergraduate and postgraduate uh given at the demands of the times and it has become much more of core concepts learning we have pillars of learning as well um across four um areas four specific areas for ug and we are starting to do it for pg as well um so we try to kind of anchor the learning in a way that allows them at least from ug or when they graduating towards pg as well that allows them much more as 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 um the exposure that they need to take it to take their their careers and anchor it um in the level that they want to so uh, because of covid i don't think things have changed only the delivery of, of those things have changed to to mm-hmm. a certain degree mm-hmm. um right now of course the university is back to operating full time on campus so we have more students coming back and being with us and of course the delivery of face to face delivery of being with students um it's easier to kind of get a hang of things while we're having a discussion but definitely it is it is it is not really kind of derailed because of of uh, the pandemic so to speak mm. you're right the delivery has changed that's all melissa yourself when you look for example at this middle part here parents the middle part is the most critical one because that's so when i look at grade 6 upwards i think there are a very uh, deliberate interventions made for students now so we do have um early guidance that we provide so grade 6 will start learning about their interest so there are a couple of activities planned around how they can understand their interest 7 and 8 will start looking at more detailed professions that are available so we have activities like interview three professionals and see what you liked about them so there are very focused activities that are going on from grade 6 and to grade 10 um most international schools have a four year program that uh, you know takes children on to this career planning grade 9 grade 10 11 and 12 at our school we we kind of take it from 
unto 10. And then of course, 11 and 12 is really serious when they actually get into shortlisting their universities, their subjects, their profiles, their portfolios. But six to 10, this middle one is actually a critical one when we are now making deliberate interventions to guide children into the different careers that they may pursue. Mm. Okay, uh, I'm conscious of the time. Um, I've noticed some of the chat questions and comments coming up here. And we don't have time to address everything here, but I'll give you the contact details. Everybody here today, if you want to follow up and just, you know, as a follow up from the webinar, um, so you can connect with them on LinkedIn and so on, and how you can connect with the schools here. Um, I have a 14 year old son. I think that's a critical phase as well. As a parent in the middle here, what should I be doing? how should I be supporting him in terms of his career map? Um, I have my own expectations, obviously, but that might not be a good thing. Uh, what should my role be? Should I be assuming that it's all well and good, that the school's looking after this? Should I be pressurizing him? Should, how, how do I encourage him without pressurizing him? You know, there's always trying to find this fine balance here without sort of turning them off by making something, you know, it sounds more like work rather than something that he could be passionate about. What are the options here? Um, do you want to? Do you guys want to pitch in with some advice here? Because I'm sure this may be relevant to everybody here today. Just some pointers, as well as maybe some pointers where I, as the example parent, may be overstepping a little bit, and I should be checking myself. Who wants to go first, Melissa? Yourself? Yes. So, uh, so Graham, like you, I do meet parents. And I've always believed that parents have the best interest of their children in mind. But sometimes I feel that um, there is this expectation, uh, you know, that actually does not take into consideration perhaps what the child wants to do. Uh, my suggestion and advice to parents is, I do understand that you want your child to achieve the best, but the better way to do it is to go along with your child to try and, you know, unwrap, unre uh, re you know, un uh, what's the word? I'm not getting the right word, but try and understand what your child is interested in hmm. and support your child in that. Don't let your aspirations, your own personal, uh, you know, aspirations be uh, dumped onto your child and wanting him to meet with your aspirations. Uh, schools do a lot. They are offering programs. Uh, parents can actually come with their children and sit on in those meetings because children tend to speak with the counselors, telling them what they are interested in. And so parents can be part of that conversation um, without stepping on their toes, being there as a cushion to support them in what they want to do. Mm. Yeah, nice advice. A partner yourself. Sorry, sorry. I think, Graham, if I may, I just wanted to add on and build up to that conversation uh, that Melissa has so beautifully put up. I think one of the best things that their parents can do is equip our children to, with the skills to pivot if necessary, which is a part of the resilience or adverse, adversity quotient or adapti adaptability quotient that uh, Melissa talked about. Because even the best researched and outlined, outlined plans can get off track, right? Um, so as parents, if you build up, if we introduce activities to them earlier, to see the bigger picture and easily identify paths or alternative paths for achieving their goals and integrate those lessons, right? Um, that will give them the resil resilience to pivot. This is extremely important. Um, and and as, as I see that, it's probably one of the biggest responsibilities as a parent that you can, you know, show them through and guide them through. Yeah. Yeah. Some great advice at the end. I mean, support, guide, you know, these are key you know skills that we as parents need to possess to you know nurture students as well as educators as well i think it's an important part when we're talking about resilience as well it's not necessarily something that comes in a textbook and it really comes through in our attitude doesn't it in we're educators and parents that if we teach our students and our children that failing is not fatal that they can try and they can try many things and they should explore and be curious. And these basic life lessons, I think will put them in good stead longer term. And that, you know, they can change direction. They can change a course 
I remember this from my own experience with my son. He wanted to change a course at school, but for him, this was like a life or death decision. But when we sat down and worked through it, you know, my goal was to help him understand that if he changed the course, you know, it's not going to be fatal, that the better outcome would come from this decision. And learning these kind of lessons is really important because when they go into the world of work, that change will be a constant. And if they're not ready for it and they haven't been, you know, exposed, which is a key word from today, to the fact that they can thrive and survive in these environments, then it's going to be difficult for them. So I think we've had some really interesting conversations today. Hopefully you enjoyed this discussion with our panelists here today. Just in summarizing and rounding up, if we can just bring back up the key links for you so you can get a seat at the next webinar as well. There's a couple of actions here as well. Firstly, connect. I'm going to give you the details of the panelists here. Just tell them that you love the webinar and... They're both on LinkedIn. So if you use LinkedIn, then you can find Melissa and Apana both on LinkedIn. Take a photo of this uh, slide so you can follow them up. I'm sure you've got questions and they'd love to ask your questions um, within reason as well. They have day jobs as well. But as you can see, they're both very passionate about the subjects. So I think if there's a follow on from today's webinar, they'd be happy to field that with you as well, at least point you in the right direction. And the second is getting a seat for the next webinar. This is a series, a six part series in the Smart Plus webinar series with the Global Schools Foundation. We're on number two. If you want to join us for number three, you have a couple of options here. You can grab a seat to jump the line and reserve your seat for the next one. You can scan the QR code here or in the chat box you can see the link and that will register you for the next webinar. We've had a lot of fun. Thank you very much to my esteemed guests here, Melissa and Aparna. Thank you for your insights today. It's a pleasure, Graham, talking to you and Aparna as well. Wonderful. And I'm sure we're going to see you to some point in these conversations along the line with Global Schools Foundation as well. Again, so looking forward to that. Thank you very much for joining us today. Thank you to all the panelists for your insights. Thank you to the guests as well for your questions and your chat comments and your hands up as well. And even for joining us live on the webinar with your audio questions. Enjoyed that very much. We had a lot of fun here today. Hopefully it was useful for you. We'll see you in part three. Wishing you all, wherever you are in the world, a wonderful and productive day. My name's Graham Brown. I'll see you in part three. Thank you. Thank you.